I'm James Nevison. I'm Kenji Hudson. Co-authors of Had a Glass. The top 100 wines under $20. We're here to talk about wine labels and what you can read on the wine label and what that might mean about the wine inside. I think we need to uh, tour around a little wine shop and demystify the language that is wine labels. Exactly. Do you want to start with this Anakina? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anakina is an interesting example, nice and clean label that's actually given us a lot of information. And this wine is from Chile, so we consider that the new world. Right. Generally, the old world is the European continent, the New World is everything else. South Africa kind of jumps between one or the other depending on who you ask. And the big thing I guess with the, the New World is that they tend to label the grapes by the type, That's or right. by the, the wines by the type. They Sorry. like the variety, they like the ca to say Cabernet, they like to say Merlot, they like to say Shiraz. Whereas in the Old World, countries like Spain, France, Italy, they tend to use the region. Right. That's right. So you might see Cote de Rhone, you might see Bordeaux, you might see Burgundy, or even other, more, even more obscure appellations. But those will talk about the region, and the grape varieties are simply the grapes that are grown in that region. So you may not necessarily know if Cote de Rhone is Grenache or Shiraz mm -hmm. or a combination of the two or other grapes as well, but you know that it's come from the Cote de Rhone region of France. So Anakina, the name of the winery, Clearly it's from Chile, Viognier, which is a pretty interesting grape type. Then you get the vintage. So this is a young vintage. You can derive from this that probably the wine is in the fresher style of winemaking in terms of aromatics, in terms of flavor profile. You'll probably get more lively acidity, more uh, lively flavors and, and aromas as opposed to something that's maybe, what, three, four, five, ten years old even, where the flavors have kind of matured and maybe you're getting a little bit more development, which they call bottle age. Mm, bottle age. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And they also say it's a single vineyard, which is not a regulatory term or anything, but what this winery is telling you is that these grapes do come from one single vineyard, and that's usually a sign of good quality. People like to use uh, grapes all from the same, same vineyard when possible. So finally, a couple more details. This one does list the, well, they all list the alcohol content. This one lists it at 14.5%, which is pretty high, and that's what a, the maximum sort of from grapes without fortification, mm. you might be looking at 15% at the maximum. So 14 and a half is up there. You might see, I don't know, Bordeaux sitting around 13 and uh, some German whites around maybe 9, 10, 11, that sort of thing. So you can kind of derive that this is going to be more of a fuller, richer, hopefully well-balanced, but we don't know that. Uh, wine. And look, it even says white wine, which makes it really <laughs> helpful for you in case you, uh, you can't see you can't that. Drive that. And the last thing is it says 750 milliliters. Ah, the standard wine The standard bottle size. But <laughs> well, we prefer the 1.5 Magnums. That's a good tip. If you show up to a party with a Magnum, you'll become everyone's friend. So do you want to have a cruise around the store? Yeah, let's look around. Okay. So next on the hit list, another had a glass top pick is Marquis de Caceres, a rosé. Can't get enough rosé during the summertime. You can't get enough rosé any time <laughs> of the year. I mean, yeah, particularly in the summer, it's a great patio wine, hey? But really, pink wines are great. And the thing about pink wine is that so many people thought for so long that it means sweet wine, it means cloying wine, it means white Zinfandel, it means all the horrible things like that. But really, true pink wine is is wonderfully dry, it's got nice acidity, it goes well with a whole bunch of different foods. You can have it with dinner, you can have it on the patio, it doesn't matter. Looking at this label, and now we have a wine from Spain, considered the old world, Marquis de Caceres, so they're still telling us the winery name, but nowhere on here do I actually see the varietal or the grape type. Instead, what we get under the vintage, Rioja, and then in small letters, the DO, or the Denominación de Origen. This is the appellation, the general region that the wine comes from. Big difference there, you know, in Spain, they're, they're saying, well, this is where the wine comes from, but they're not exactly telling you what grapes go into that bottle right on the label. It takes a bit of time to figure out exactly which words are the appellations and which words are the varieties, but over time you get to know those. And that's where, you know, a bit of research, you know, plug it into, uh, into a search engine or getting a wine book, you yeah. know, that covers the different appellations will, will help you out quite a bit. Um, you mentioned, I think it was interesting, the, the whole dryness issue. And so what about looking at alcohol uh, content? Does that tell us anything about, let's see, oh, here, so here, this is a 13.5% uh, listed rosé. Around this range of alcohol, that's a good point, around this range of alcohol, um, I think we can assume that this wine is going to be on the drier side. What, what I mentioned before about the German whites that are usually sitting around, say, 8, 9, 10% alcohol, that usually suggests that the wine might have a little bit of residual sweetness, might have a little bit of uh, sugar left in it after the fermentations are done or perhaps added back into the wine. So when we see those lower alcohols, we can think to ourselves, you know, maybe we're going to get a little bit of uh, off-dry white here. 
in terms of this kind of wine at 13 and a half and the, the Anakin at 14 and a half, we're definitely thinking, okay, this is gonna be a dry wine. There's a fairly uh, rich uh, alcohol content here and yeah, what's wrong with alcohol? <laughs> in moderation, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, and, and it's, I guess, a simple process, right, of how the alcohol gets into the wine, right? And so if you think of this sort of magic winemaking formula, essentially you get sugars, which come naturally from the, the grapes, right? And then the yeast starts to eat the sugar and turning it into alcohol, right? And so the more that the yeast eats away at the sugar, the drier the, uh, the wine becomes, and, you know, theoretically, the higher the alcohol goes. Right. Should we move on? I'm going for reds. Thirsty. Reds. Look at that label. So here we have another wine from Spain. Yeah. But different in this sense because now they're not listing the region. They're not listing the appellation. They're telling us the grape variety. It's a little bit harder to recognize on this label because it's not stated as clearly, but it is Garnacha. It's the same grape known as Grenache in France and most other parts of the world. So this is just a straight up, great, full bodied steak wine. Or if you're a vegetarian, eggplant, grilled portobellos, that sort of thing. But I know right when we go saying, oh yeah, this is how old world labels are, this is how new world labels are. Like anything, the wine world is changing quite a bit. So you end up with a wine from Spain, the old world, that looks very much like a lot of new world labels in the sense that it's it's very artistic and uh, yeah, as Kenji was saying, Garnacha de Fuego, literally the, the Garnacha of the Fire, not a very old world traditional looking label. We still see the vintage down here, 2005, so we know that it's been in bottle for a little while and there's some more information on the back. It talks about the fire. Ah, the story behind the fire. Okay, the next wine that we're gonna look at. This is the De Bordelis Petit Syrah, their DB series. We love this wine because it's not expensive, $10.99, but it tastes great. It's just an easy, everyday, sort of Wednesday night wine. So again, on this label, it's the same sort of deal. This is a New World wine from Australia. We've got the Petit Syrah, which is the great variety. 2006 is a vintage, so it's one year younger than the Spanish wine. So it might be a little bit fresher. We, we don't know that for sure, but we can kind of take it. De Bordelis is the name of the winery, and from there, everything else is pretty Standard. You know, this is the second bottle we've looked at that has a screw cap. Pretty interesting, hey? We're seeing more and more screw caps, aren't we? And not only on whites, but in this case on a red. On a red, yeah, which is uh, a very contemporary, I think, packaging method for, for good quality wines. Your view on screw caps? Love them. Love them. Thumbs up? Uh, way up. I still have my <laughs> corkscrew collection, but uh, yeah, screw caps never have to worry about the, the wine being tainted. The last wine we're going to look at, the very fancy Santa Rio de Medeo Real just checks in under the $20 mark. But you know, this is a wonderfully bold Cabernet Sauvignon, and so for people that like bold, big red wines, Medeo Real Cabernet Sauvignon is a good option. Again, just sort of decoding the label if you are. Now hopefully we're starting to, to see similar information and we kind of understand what it means. So. This wine is from Chile, New World, and there it is, Cabernet Sauvignon listed prominently. So that is the grape type, the varietal. And then they actually do list the region that it's coming from as well underneath, the Maipo Valley. 2004 is the vintage, and Santorita is the winery. The thing I like about this wine too is that it has sort of, a, it is a New World uh, wine, that's for sure, but it still has some sort of Old World sensibilities. It's not all big and in your face, right? It's got some nice, Old world sensibilities. <laughs> Any chances you that have some a... old world sensibilities. Oh, oh, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> it is. Hey, what about bubbly? Oh, Sparkling wines. Yes. Can't forget the bubble. This is an interesting bottle because this is a Dienhard Lila and it's from Germany. It's a Riesling sect and it's listed as a brute style. $13.99. It's a really good value sparkler for any sort of celebration, any sort of wine cocktails, or any just time you need to have sparkling wine, which pairs remarkably well with food. I think a lot of people just think of, you know, popping the cork on New Year's Eve with their sparkling wine, but it actually goes wonderfully with every, everything from omelets, which is why you get the Sunday brunch, That's right. to a lot of cheeses, I find. Yeah, so all year round is sparkling wine and rosé. <laughs> so those are a few things, you know, that you can learn uh, about wine labels. That's right, so when you're looking at the label, you can look at what the name of the producer is, you can look at the country where it's come from, and you can look at whether you're looking at the varietal, a grape variety, or you're looking at the region of production. And also a few choices just to hopefully uh, help you expand your wine diversity.